We're so excited. We have Kim Linkle here to present. She is the director of the Coalition for Drug-Free Batesville in uh, Batesville, Indiana, and is part of the CADCA Coalition Development Team. She has over 20 years of experience in coalition development, specifically focusing on substance abuse prevention. She holds a master's degree in leadership development from St. Mary's of the Woods, and she has had various positions working with coalitions locally, regionally, and statewide. Um, her experience is concentrated on coaching drug-free community grannies and community coalitions. She is driven by assisting coalitions in creating community-wide change to improve their community one change at a time. She enjoys seeing people come together to work on improving their community by focusing on common goals. And if you have not had an opportunity to see Kim present or work with her, you are in for a treat today. So thank you, Kim. We're glad you're here. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, hi everyone. And thank you for joining this conversation today. Um, as Kimber said, my name is Kim Linkle and I am here today to spend a few minutes with you talking about youth engagement. I always like to initially um, kind of go over what, what it is I'm talking about and what does that mean? So what is youth engagement? This engagement is the result when young people are involved in responsible, challenging actions to create positive social change. It includes involving youth in both the planning and decision making that affects both themselves and others throughout the community. And it happens in youth adult partnerships that are structured so that both groups contribute, teach and learn from one another. So I'm gonna walk through seven steps in promoting youth engagement. And within each of these steps, I will share a little bit of information, how we here locally in our community um, engage youth, as well as you know, offer um, examples of other communities that have really involved youth at a level where they are part of that overall planning decision-making and implementation. So the first step is to prepare yourself to share the power. This is probably the most challenging step for us adults, because many times we just wanna do the work and say, okay, now this is what we need done and hand off the work to the youth. Um, and in reality, we really need to step back and allow the youth to be part of that whole experience and to truly share that power with us. As I said, it's one of the most challenging steps and it really takes time to overcome that, you know, hey, we all this planned and then we just pass that off. I know initially when our youth group started Many years ago, even prior to me being one of the advisors, you know, it was easy for the adult team that was working with the youth to, you know, someone would reach out and say, hey, would you like to be part of this upcoming event? And the adults um, at that time would say, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they want to be involved. And so one shift that we have made here locally is any time that someone reaches out to us, an organization, a person. Um, and wants us to get involved as a youth group, my immediate response is, you know what, that sounds great. Let me take that back to the youth to see what their interest level is. Um, because if they're not interested and they're not far deciding what they're going to be doing, the likelihood that they're gonna become truly engaged in the overall process is much less likely than if they get to select and be part of the work that they are doing. The next step is to build relationships with youth. And this goes way beyond those once a month meetings or you know, twice a month meetings, however often you are meeting with your youth. It truly is building those relationships outside 
of that specific organization that you are serving as the youth advisor for. One example I have, and I try to do my best is, you know, I try to make a, um, the, the different sporting events within our community. I went to a junior high volleyball game last week to see one of my good friend's daughters play and several of our mayor's youth council members also play on the seventh and or eighth grade team. And it was, uh, you know, it made me feel really good after the game. I got a text from one of the mayor's youth council members and it said, Hey, thanks for coming. It means so much for us to us that you come, you know, and support us. So even though I wasn't necessarily there to just support that one mayor's youth council member, you know, they see that they see you supporting them. If, you know, their names in the newspaper or if, you know, the school corporation, um, you know, make the social media post and I see it and one of our youth council members are, you know, tagged in it or mentioned in it, you know, congratulate them or, you know, at the next, the next time you see them, you know, make a mention of that because those relationships is really what builds that long term rapport and really gets the youth to want to be further engaged, not only with the youth coalition, but ultimately, you know, you as a community member. We also want to encourage exploration, discovery, and self-expression. We know during this time in, you know, young people's lives, this is when they're really growing and really kind of becoming, you know, transitioning from that kid phase to that adult phase. So we want to give the, them the opportunity to have, you know, um, that to, to explore new opportunities, to discover new things about them, and to be able to express themselves. Um, we uh, have worked with different entities and brought them into our youth council. So we currently, and we just started this last year, we have an adult from Purdue Extension um, come along with Safe Passage. We have two of their prevention specialists and they work with the youth to, on you know, team building, getting to know one another, you know, just even growing each of those youth. And so we have really seen the kids grow because it gives them an opportunity to talk with one another, to talk with other youth besides us that aren't their teachers or their immediate family, you know, and to really have those opportunities. We also include our mayor at our council, at our youth council meetings. So it also gives them an opportunity to have those conversations with our mayor. You know, what's going on in our community? What are the challenges? Where can we, as young people, help and, you know, um, assist in making our community a safer and healthier place? So giving them the opportunities, you know, to explore different um, things is truly a way to get them engaged and for them to realize that, you know what? you as adults or we as adults are not guiding the process. We are truly offering the process to them and allowing them to grow and become who they, you know, are going to become as adults. Another step is to instill the skills to make learning meaningful. And, you know, the biggest thing about this is bringing people um, from the outside into the youth council. So many times we will have other organizations come and present about what they're working on, or if there's an event that they would like our youth council to be part of, we will have them come and, you know, share with the youth council. So again, it's not always just us as advisors, but we're really wanting, you know, them to learn the skills to have those conversations with other adults across our community and, you know, teaching them how to, you know, do public speaking, how to put themselves out there, um, how to do resume building. And so really working with them as a unit to build their own skills so that they, you know, can continue to learn and grow. I know one um, area that 
it, it seems very small, but I have had several youth council members over the years say, you know what, that kind of broke the ice for, for me as far as public speaking. Um, one of the requirements of our youth council is that they have to attend a city council meeting throughout the school year. So they just have to go to one monthly meeting. Um, and at that monthly meeting, our mayor always welcomes all the mayor's youth council members and they have to, they stand up, they introduce themselves, they say um, their grade, how long they've been involved, they um, state which committee they work on, and then one thing that they really like about the youth council. So again, you know, typically, um, you know, besides the city council, there might be 10, 15 people in the audience. So it's not a huge um, public speaking opportunity, but it still gives them that opportunity to stand up in front of adults and many of which may be strangers, you know, and just to share those concrete, uh, that concrete information about them. So it, it's a fairly simple task, but yet it just starts to develop those skills so that they can, you know, ultimately um, perfect them and become good at them as they get into high school, college, and even, you know, their careers down the road. Another area that we always encourage groups to engage youth is to provide leadership opportunities. And sometimes this can be fairly challenging as, you know, all of us have tons of opportunities to attend local conferences, you know, local trainings, regional, and even, you know, statewide and national trainings. There isn't always as many opportunities for the youth. So anytime we um, have the opportunity to have our youth involved in a training with other youth, um, we try to take advantage of that as much as possible. We're very fortunate down here in southeastern Indiana to have a regional um, organization, a regional coalition called Prevention First out of the greater Cincinnati area. Um, and they do a lot of youth engagement opportunities. They have one coming up here next month. And so, you know, we put that out and we will invite our youth to come and be part of that. So not only do they get to you know, go outside of the community to um, receive some additional training, there's always a fun component to that and they get to meet others from other communities. And so, you know, trying to find those leadership opportunities is always um, something that we like to do to provide to them so that they can um, continue to learn and really find out what other coalitions are doing, what other youth are, you know, involved in and interested in. And so that we can, as a group, really work to you know, develop, continue to develop our youth as leaders. And then this is a little bit different than that, you know, and still the skills to make learning meaningful. Um, you know, really look at developing those advanced skills. So really looking at skills that the youth and young adults are going to need throughout their lifetime. One perfect example that we have built over time, this did not work so uh, seamlessly initially, is, you know, we have um, several different requirements and I'll talk a lot in for our youth council that was all implemented by our youth council members. We as adults did not implement any of these. This was actually the leaders of the youth council came to us and wanted to implement them a few years ago. Um, but one of them is that you cannot you cannot have more than two unexcused absences. Um, and so what an unexcused absence is, is if you do not show up and you have not let one of the advisors know you are not going to be there. Um, and so we talk a lot in our meetings about that, you know, responsibility. You simply have to send a text to one of the, say, hey, I'm not going to be there next Tuesday. You don't have to give an explanation. It's, you know, we we don't need to lie. It is simply that responsibility of saying, hey, you know, I'm not going to be there next week. Um, and what that ultimately does then, we have seen, is really it develops that respect of the other youth council members. Last September, we actually ended up canceling our youth council meeting because of the 32 youth that we have on our roster, 
we were only going to have 12 of them at the meeting due to a wide variety of things, mostly uh, sport, sporting events and sporting activities. And so, you know, we as the advisors, along with the officers decided to cancel that meeting because we knew, you know, having 20 of our members missing, there wasn't going to be a lot of work or a lot of planning to be able to be done. And so we talk a lot about that, you know, respect and responsibility. And those are tools that we need our youth to have, not only now as, you know, seventh through 12th graders, you know, but obviously in the workforce, if you know, you're not going to make it to work, you need to let your employer know. You need to have respect for your coworkers as adults. And so really working to develop their skills, um, both for the immediate need, obviously, like, you know, because we don't, want to, you know, have other youth come to a meeting if there's five other people there, but, you know, instilling those good uh, skills to the youth for long-term purposes. Um, we also, another skill that we have developed kind of, and it's kind of just happened over the years, we uh, several years ago started offering a youth leadership camp. So our youth council is seventh through 12th grade. And we offer a youth leadership camp for those students that are going into the fifth grade and sixth grade um, the, in the fall. So we do a summer camp um, and our youth, um, our youth council members pretty much run that camp. And so, you know, they have developed a lot of skills, whether it comes to planning an entire week of activities, whether it comes to what supplies are needed for the different activities um, and really, getting them those skills that, you know, they will be able to use long-term. And we have really seen many of our youth council members just flourish um, by giving them these opportunities and seeing what skills they already come with, because many of them already have some of these skills. And so that is um, very exciting to us to see them grow and just to become, you know, um, positive influences, not only on other youth, but even on the community overall. We were very fortunate a few years ago and wrote a grant and the youth pretty much put the grant together. Um, myself and another youth council member, we went through and, you know, just made sure we wordsmithed it, make, you know, just to make sure it sounded um, grammatically correct and things, but we received that grant. And so our youth council was able to put up a mural in our community um, and have a national artist come in and do that. And so that was a big deal for them. You know, they, they learned many skills. Um, they had to put a budget together. They had to, um, they had to raise the additional dollars because this grant was only for X number of dollars. And we knew it was going to take much more than that to, you know, secure this artist and have her do the mural. So, you know, they worked through that and they presented to the city council. Um, and so just, again, continuing to offering, offer them opportunities to advance their skills and to learn new things that they may not have if they weren't part of our youth council. And then finally, the last step is to reflect and adjust the program to improve youth engagement. And this is so important as adults and as the youth leaders of youth coalitions, because we know that things change over time. We've all lived, you know, in a pandemic for the last couple of years. And so we had to adjust and meet the youth where they were during this time. Um, I'm not sure how all of your youth were. Our youth had absolutely no interest in meeting over Zoom. They said, you know what, like we just were Zoomed out. They, you know, they were doing Zoom for school all day. They had, you know, they, Many of them, um, you know, attend some type of a faith um, organization. So they were, you know, streaming church on the weekends and they just said, you know what, we, we do not want to meet via Zoom. So we truly, from March of 2020 until September of that year, we truly took a pause in our youth council. Um, we offered them opportunities um, to um, get some hours. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, in different ways than really coming together and volunteering, you know, as a group in the community. Um, but just, you know, so we had to make a change there. As I mentioned, um, 
um, it's probably been three or four years ago, ago now, the youth leadership team came to us and they said, you know what, we feel like many of the youth that are part of this youth council are just here so they can put it on their resume. They're truly not engaged in the process. And so they asked us if we would implement a minimum required number of hours. And so each year, our youth council members are expected to donate or give back 50 hours of time throughout the year. Um, I know initially some of our youth was like, oh my God, that is way too much. How can you expect us to do 50 hours a year? And so as we broke it down, you know, I said, well, if you start in August and you think, you know, from August to the end of July, 50 hours, and if you do nothing in the summer, uh, five hours a month. And they were all like, oh, you know what? That's much more doable than, you know, when you say 50 hours. Um, and, and with our camp back up and running now post COVID, we have, um, you know, most of our youth have all of their hours before school even starts. Um, and so they have realized that, you know, those 50 hours are, are very important because we need um, our youth to show their involvement. We need our adult coalitions to show their involvement, but this also helps us in tracking our in-kind hours. And it also is a way to celebrate our youth um, at our at the June um, city council meeting, we always go and recognize our outgoing seniors, and you know just congratulate them and thank them. We have them bring their parents um, and introduce their parents. They share where they're going to college and you know where they're attending, and then um, we also are able to announce um, which one of our students you know got X number of hours. Now the vast majority always get 50 hours. And if not, we allow them to have that conversation. We're not just like, oh, you only got 32 hours. You, you know, you can't participate next year. You know, so we have that conversation as to why and what happened um, or, you know, why they weren't able to get their hours. And so we, you know, it's not that hard and fast, but yet we have youth, I know last year that had 75 hours and we make a big deal about that. We give them a small, you know, token of our appreciation. To our community. And so, you know, just looking at always um, reflecting on the things that are going well and the things that we need to change and how we can, you know, move forward. And so really, you know, um, doing ongoing process improvement, right? We always are looking at ways to do more and um, more effective work with our adult coalitions and our community coalitions. And we should be doing the same thing with the youth coalitions. And, oh. and so I just wanted to show, share with you a little bit about what our youth council here in the Bates Hill community looks like. Um, these are just some pictures of some different activities that we're in, we've been involved with um, over the summer. We, like I mentioned, we, um, we are a seventh through 12th grade um, youth council. Some I know are, you know, only senior high, some have junior and senior high split. We have found that keeping them in the same group for six years, really, um, we can see the growth, you know, and we as advisors giggle sometimes because, you know, we look at um, their pictures when they came in as seventh graders and then like where they are when they're seniors. Uh, and, you know, we have our youth group has been around for many years, I think almost um, 15 years now. And so we, you know, we have youth that are now, you know, doctors and attorneys and teachers. And it, it's just exciting to see where our youth go. Now, could these youth doctors and attorneys and you know teachers and all this without our um without being part of the youth council probably I mean I don't know that we've impacted them that much but hopefully we have developed a few um additional skills in them so that you know they they really want to be successful um in you know, in their adult life and to continue to give back. You know, our ultimate goal, what we would absolutely love in our community, and I'm guessing many of you would, um, is if these youth council members, you know, graduate from college and come back to our community to raise their families and, you know, to be um, 
to be employed in our community. And so by getting them truly engaged in what, you know, the youth um, work of our community looks like, hopefully, you know, ultimately that will get at least a higher percentage of them to come back ultimately to our community. And so um, with that, I'm going to, I see there's a few things in the chat. So I wanted to check that. Oh, it was just Kimbra saying to put what county. So if, you, if you've if you entered um, recently, put what county. Um, and then with that, I was just going to open it up for any questions or any um, comments. If, you know, and if someone else has another great idea that's really worked well for your community, please, you know, feel free to share. We have about five to six questions um, or any other comments, but um, my contact information is there. So absolutely, if you have any questions or if you're starting a youth council, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, I know I've talked to Du Bois County several times. I know that they're really getting youth involved. We did a strategic prevention framework training for them um, to get them just up to par. Um, and so um, with that, I will open it up if anyone has any questions or any comments. Do you provide the youth with food? And if you do, how do you fund it? Because that's always an ongoing issue with us. And we usually end up paying for the food out of our own pockets because our grants typically don't cover food. Yes. So we actually meet at 6 p.m. Um, and so we do not do food traditionally. Um, we used to early on um, when the youth council first started, we did pizza at 530 with um the meeting starting at six. And what we found is fewer and fewer youth came to eat. And so we had all this pizza left over all the time um, because they said, well, we're just going to eat with mom and dad or, you know, for, for some reason we have a lot of healthy youth. Um, and so, you know, you know we, we're going to, you know, have what mom and dad are having and then, you know, they come. And so we have found we don't need to offer food. However, um, when we do offer food, you know, we look for sponsors because you're right, you know, many of the grants do not provide food. Um, our mayor has been very gracious and most of the time will just cover that for us. Um, you know, I know that our local um, electricity or electric co-op um, has a, it's called a roundup grant that you can apply for every I think it's twice a year you can apply for that. So we have done that in the past. Um, sometimes, you know, myself or the other advisors like, you know what, I'll do that. They've done so much for us, you know, like we'll, we'll provide that back. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, we do pay for it out of pocket, but we all are always looking for sponsorships and ways to do that when we need to. Uh, but traditionally we do not cover that on a regular basis. Do you have transportation issues? And if so, how do you handle that? So we are a citywide coalition. And so we don't face as many transportation um, challenges as many coalitions do that are countywide. I do know some countywide coalitions, you know, they will meet during the school day if they can. I know locally, like we have twice a week in our high school and junior high, we have like advisory times. We can meet if we need to meet during the school day. Um, so we haven't necessarily faced that transportation issue. However, what I would say is we could have youth that aren't involved because of not having transportation, but they have not shared that with us. They have just not applied, which, you know, is another whole, you know, challenge to figure out because we would want to, you know, figure out that transport if that was the only thing holding someone back. Hey, Kim, this is Kay. I just want to say- Hi. Hey, I just want to say your presentation was very informative and I really enjoyed it. Thanks. So with that, if there are no more questions or, oh, I, there was just a comment in the chat. Shelby County Youth Council meets one time a month during the school day and they are bused from the schools. 
we have paid for food via LCC funds and sponsors. So it looks like they also look for sponsors as well. And then they use some of their LCC funds to cover that. And yeah, um, that's interesting that Shelby County um, meets during the school day and buses their kids because I also know that that's what Hancock County um, does. They meet during the school day and they, um, they bus their kids to a central location to have those youth council members meet. I am going to turn it back over to Sarah and the team. And so, like I said, if anyone has any questions, my um, contact information is right there or Kimbra always has it. So feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you, Kim. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Let's go on um, to Sadia. If uh, she or Janet... Um, is available to provide, provide us a brief update from ICJI. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is an emotional day for me, so I'm just going to say it. <laughs> okay, so as some of you know that my last day at ICJI is on September 28th, so I would like to use this opportunity to thank you all uh, for your dedication and an effort. I enjoyed working with you and learned a few things from you all. I must say uh, that you guys are an asset to your communities and you do play a critical role in the successful operations of the LCC. So thank you. Um, once I leave, Janet will oversee LCCs in my regions um, until the replacement is hired. Uh, you all know that the next quarterly report is due on October 15, and ICGI will open an early window on October 1st. So I would suggest please keep an eye on emails from the BHID or from Janet. In future, if you have any questions or need assistance, um, please reach out to Janet. Uh, she will be the only one taking care of quarterly report submission of 90 counties next month. And she will be stretched thin during that time. So if you do not hear from her within a reasonable time period, I request you to be patient. You guys cooperated well with me when Cody left, and I'm sure that you will understand this uh, time again. Uh, and then I would just like to say that I will miss working with you, and thank you so much for all the work that you guys do for your communities. I, for those of you that have worked with Sadia, you know how passionate she is about this, this the LCCs in the community. So thank you for your years of service and, and it was an honor to work with you. Thank you, same here. Okay. Um... There is a message, um, a chat from Natasha. My connection is spotty, audio is garbled. Here's the update from Drug Free Marion County. Our grant applications are live on our website. Okay, they have grants and due Monday, October 3rd by 5 p.m. There's there's 50,000 available in three different categories. So the details are on the chat. You may be interested. All right. Thank you yep. for that. If anybody wants to check that out from Natasha in Marion County. Um, yeah, it's on the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to give some updates for the next couple months. Um, sep September, we are going to have a recap of Recovery Month, and we're asking for any participants that uh, want to kind of have a discussion in a roundtable. Uh, Jody uh, will be leading that up, Jody Miller, um, part of the ICN team, as well as... Um, Jody and I am going to butcher your other title. Do you want to go over that? <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Miller. I'm the Deputy De Director for the Indiana Addictions Issues Coalition, and I'm also the Manager of Peer Support for the Central Region for the uh, Regional Recovery Hubs. And yeah, next month, we're going to be recapping uh, some of the events um, with Recovery Month. It's been a very busy month. I'm sure you're all probably feeling the same way. Uh, but just to give you a couple um, events that are still happening, actually, this coming Saturday, we have a recovery ride in Indianapolis that starts at uh, Southside Harley and ends up at the Suburban North Club up in Noblesville, Indiana. So if you happen to be in the area and want to be involved in that, please come out and join us. We also color the, can color the canal in downtown Indianapolis on Friday, September the 30th. I know Kimbra is going to be coming out for that. So um, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's really cool to just see the, the canal turn purple and the fountain that goes off and we're going to have some speakers. We're going to have some live music, um, but uh, hope you can join us for that. Happy recovery month, everyone. Thank you, Jody. Um, so we'll, we'll again recap. If you have some events or had some events going on through the month of September in your area and would like to have those, um, share those, we're going to do it via roundtable um, and just send us an email that you would like to participate um, or just jump in that day. It's going to be, uh, September is going to be pretty free flowing so that we can- October. Oh, I'm sorry, October. I'm a month behind <laughs> so that we can all share and learn from each other. Um, and then we are going to ask for December, uh, we're going to be asking for presenters, um, three or four of the communities, the LCCs or DFCs, um, to participate in a roundtable discussion of. Uh, their LCCs, uh, their events, their things that they have done within their communities so that we can um, share from each other and learn from each other and just uh, support one another through um, this, this process here in the state of Indiana and um, collaborate further. Um, uh, so again, that's in December. We will have a special presentation in November. Those dates for November and December will change uh, because of the holidays, and we will be sending those dates out to everyone so that you will have those um, and can get them on your calendar. Um, also, if you are not a um, Indiana Coalition Network member, um, and that is from any LCC or drug-free communities grantees um, in the state of Indiana, you can become uh, a member of the ICN and have access to all of the information on the websites. Um, we are beginning to put training information that individuals are having across the state. Um, if you want to send that in to us and it will be on the website and you can click on that and learn about uh, free or uh, training that are at, it has, is at a reduced cost um, available within our state that will be on that website. So again, if your community is having anything like that, please send it to the um, information link on the website.